Uh, hello, everyone, again. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, this week's discussion uh, is on Hua Yan Buddhism. Uh, this is another installment in our uh, series on the introduction to East Asian Buddhism. And this will round out the fourth and last of the main uh, strictly Chinese schools of thought and practice. We've talked about Tiantai, Chan, uh, Pure Land, and now Hua Yan. Uh, this, with Tiantai, make up the two doctrinal schools, um, Chan and Pure Land, the two practice schools. Uh, as we've already discussed, there was a lot of overlap between these movements. Um, they are not distinct, isolated schools. They are four, the four most popular Buddhist movements of Chinese origin. As the Dharma spread from India and Central Asia, China's appropriation of Mahayana doctrine was expressed in the development of these new perspectives. These four would go on to influence East Asian Buddhism on the whole for the next 1500 years. Um, slide. And Hua Yan might be considered one of the highest expressions of Chinese Buddhist thought and philosophy. Although I should mention Hua Yan is both a sutra and the name of uh, the school based on that sutra. So Hua Yan Jing is the sutra, Hua Yan Zong is the um, is the school. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Hua Yan is the Chinese name, uh, naming of the Avantamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra. And therefore, the Hua Yan school developed out of adherence to that particular teaching. I call it a, a trend of philosophical devotion. And that might be a, a slight misnomer, but the idea is that there were large groups of practitioners that would primarily focus on teachings found in the Abhatamsaka Sutra. And in the, sa in the same way as Tiantai and Tendai um, are Lotus Sutra doctrinal schools. I mean, we can all remember this glorious diagram here um, during these five periods of the Buddha's teaching. Um, what you see is a hundred years before the formal start of a Hua Yan school, but Already, Hua Yan Sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra, was of high importance. You'll see up at the top there, Jiri puts uh, it as the first period of the Buddha's discourses, the sudden teaching. Jiri saw the sutra itself as so profound that when it was, was expounded originally, no one understood it, and was therefore a short-lived phase of the Buddha's teachings, because the next period, would have been that of the gradual teachings, that of the Triptaka, Pali Canon, and onwards. Jiri's choice to put it in here, in this sequence, is historically incorrect. Uh, but it has to do more with the importance of what the sutra is explaining. Not everyone hearing the teaching during the Huaqian period would have attained an ability to understand it. They were not able to comprehend the core teaching of the sutra itself, and that is of interpenetration. This would have been a difficult concept to teach, and thus no one could hear it in the way that it was intended. Now, I should mention that the Hua Hengzong, the Hua Yan school, did categorize, um, did a categorization, a schemata much like this, but they placed the Hua Yan sutra um, much where, like um, uh, Jiri e puts, the Lotus and Nirvana Sutra um, in this schemata. So they considered the Hua Yan Sutra the complete teachings, which could make sense. But more to the point here is that to say that well before a formalized school was developed, early Chinese Buddhists saw the importance of this sutra. Slide, please. And so during Jiri's time, uh, kind of mid to late uh, 6th century, a Hua Yan movement would have only just started as a, as a group of commentaries of particular Someone's devotees. Oh, someone's coming in. Um, over time, they would have become an, an identified a distinctly Chinese school of thought, naming, uh, naming Fa Zong, 643 to 712, retrospectively as the founder. Although in true Chinese fashion, Fa Zong um, defers uh, that uh, prestige and places himself after his previous teachers, uh, thus naming him the third of the Huaqian patriarch. Regardless of his, uh, regardless, it's a distinct movement established by the end of the seventh century, 
And in the following few hundred years, it spreads to Korea as Kwaom, I'm butchering that naming, I'm sorry, pronunciation, I'm sorry, and Japan as Kigong. More on Hwaian school in a few, but I wanted to at least go to the, the sutra a little bit itself. So please slide. I want to provide a bit of context um, on why this particular sutra was so important to these early patriarchs. Because it does stand out as a fairly particular sutra. To many, this sutra represents a, a culmination, the highest expression of Buddhist thought. D.T. Suzuki writes in Thomas Cleary's translation, and I quote, as to the Avatamsaka Sutra, it is really the consummation of Buddhist thought, Buddhist sentiment, and Buddhist experience. To my mind, no religious literature in the world can ever approach the grandeur of conception, the depth of feeling, and the gigantic scale of composition as attained by this sutra." End quote. So first off, I have to say, in relation to what D.T. Suzuki is saying, yes, this sutra is huge. It is one of the longest Buddhist sutras. Thomas Cleary's translation is over a thousand pages without a glossary or index. Okay, um, it, The whole text is 36, 38-ish chapters, depending on the translation. Um, and scholars have concluded that at least to this point, we can say that the collection, it's a collection of much smaller sutras. But we could generally categorize the various chapters through follow, uh, the following themes, though many chapters contain more than one focus. And first off, a lot of the chapters describe the nature of the world as seen by the Tathagata, the Buddha. Two, the, the nature of Buddhas and their powers. Three, the qualities of bodhisattvas and their quest for awakening, and four, what is learned and what happens in practice and during awakening. It assumes that these chapters would have been assembled, um, it's assumed that these chapters would have been assembled during the second to fourth centuries, again, in and around the areas of northern India, Central Asia, um, and probably in small part in parts of uh, China. All we know currently is that Buddha Bhadra, a, a prolific Sanskrit translator, produced the first recorded uh, Chinese translation around 420 CE. There have been other notable translations since, uh, obviously, but as an introduction to this teaching to China, we, could, we would be talking about generally around the latter half of the 5th century. But the content of this sutra, I mean, it, it's fascinating. It's fascinating, complex, um, structurally repetitive also. I mean, it's just really hard for me. It's just really hard to read. Um, the sutra starts with the merits of the Buddha uh, and, and that them themselves blossom like the garland of flowers. It, it describes the Buddha's awakening, attended by the multitudes of divine beings. Buddha, the Buddha instructs the great assembly in the palace of God Indra, and similarly assembles all celestial uh, assemblies in other celestial planes, also accompanied by their multitudes. Buddha teaches that all beings have the Buddha nature, that all phenomena are mutually originating and interdependent, and that finally all is Vairochana Buddha, that there is the Tathagata Karma. <clears throat> All along the way, it's filled with imagery, descriptions of lofty, fantastical sights and experiences. And again, it's really difficult to read as a narrative. Though, through this huge volume, while teaching about these concepts, it, it is providing vast descriptions of the phenomenal universe. And for any practitioner, paints, um, paints immense images that can and could fill the focused samadhi, a meditative state. And that's exactly what happened. First off, again, Hua Han is a Chinese school of thought, and therefore was distinctly Chinese, and would have been influenced by other philosoph philosophical insights of the time, whether Buddhist, Taoist, Confucian, uh, what have you. But, ha but the sutra, having grabbed the attention of these early Chinese devotees, soon a plethora of commentaries were being produced. Besides, it probably helped to make sense of the sutra on the whole. 
The first prominent figure would have been Duchesne, and I'm sorry, I'm butchering the pronunciation. He writes many works focused on the Avatamsaka Sutra and teaches Jiryang, who in turn becomes the second named patriarch. Jiryang starts to really establish a Huayang doctrine, and the, then comes his student Fazang. And here, the school of thought becomes much more formalized through Fazang's vast writings and commentaries. He's named the de facto founder, um, but third patriarch. He, he was tied politically and brought Huayang um, thought to a much more mainstream, if we could call it that. And Huayang as a school gets spread to Korea in the latter 7th century and Japan in the latter 8th in, in Nara as Keigo. It, it did subsequently fall out of favor based on political and social factors we have discussed in the past, 9th, 10th century. Um, and, and as did many other uh, Chinese schools at the time, it, 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 Tiantai included. But while it was being practiced, the Huayang doctrine had huge impacts on the philosophical norms at that time. The school provided a way to systematically understand the Avatamsaka Sutra. The early patriarchs and practitioners took the ideas of dependent origination, um, that nothing is autonomous or independent, and interpreted it as saying that all phenomena in the universe are mutually creating, and in turn are being mutually created by all other phenomena. We are in a constant state of interaction, causally dependent with the entire universe, and that all these phenomena arise out of Tathagatagarbha, the, the Buddha nature. Experiencing this type of integration and realization of oneness of all phenomena was not necessarily a new concept, but in Huayan Buddhism, and in fact in all East Asian Mahayana after this fact, the Bodhisattva's integration of that oneness awareness into <clears throat> ordinary activities, everyday stuff, the mundane reality was of highest importance. Perpetually being in a state of awareness of both mundane and absolute in each moment. This is big. We talk about this a lot. We talk about taking meditation off the cushion. Jiri in his Makashikan talks about uh, four meditations, uh, sitting, walking, sitting and walking. But it's the last when he talks about meditation while neither sitting or walking. It's a state of complete, I, I, have, I have no idea, I have no idea, I, I can't <laughs> pretend to know. Um, I can barely get through sitting meditation, so. Um, but, but like I said, that perspective and that goal of practice became dominant throughout East Asian Buddhism, as did Hua Hyun's description of interpenetration, a notion that there is nothing separating all dharmas, phenomena, and shunyata, emptiness. Indra's net. We've discussed a few times in the last couple of weeks the descriptions of Indra's net. Monshin Sensei mentioned it only last week. This idea of a vast cosmic net. And then at each knot, a precious jewel suspended, reflecting all the multitudes of other jewels suspended in their knot, and thus itself in the reflection of all of those other jewels. We are within and connected to all things, as they are within us. Along with his commentary on Indra's net, Fadzang had other examples and ways to describe this, uh, this phenomenon, this teaching. <clears throat> And a few really struck me. One, uh, he describes an octagonal box uh, made out of mirrors pointing inwards. So eight sides of mirrors with a top and bottom. Inside the box uh, is the Buddha sitting with a single candle flame. And to me, that image of what that single flame 
does in all directions. Just I, I can't get it out of my mind. It, it's fascinating. Um, as a way to describe what they're trying to get at. Slide, please. The the other is the metaphor of the rafter and the house. It's found in Fadzang's paragraphs on the doctrine of difference and identity of the one vehicle of walking on. In summary, the house represents the whole universe, the realm of all phenomena. The rafter is any one of those phenomena. Thus, if we consider that the house is simply the sum of its parts, then each part of that house, like an individual rafter, is part of the identity of the house. It makes what the house is. The rafter also can be identified as a rafter only in relation to it being part of the house. Otherwise, it's just a piece of wood. But Zang uses the word fused, uh, interfused, since it's its identity as a rafter is reliant upon being part of the house. We would go, he would go on to say that the house is only that house because of those particular parts. And so the house creates the rafter. And the rafter, or any other part, creates the house. They create each other. And as a side note, I have to relate it back, the entirety of Indra's net is reliant upon all of those jewels that make it up in the same way that all of those jewels are reliant upon the net. So each phenomena is reliant and dependent upon all other phenomena and therefore cannot be autonomous. Although dharmas, phenomena, are distinct and particular. Because if there were any other way, we would have a different universe. I replace a rafter with a new one. What happens to the house? It's still a house, but different. The sill reacts to the weight of the rafter differently. The sheathing, the roofing sheathing, attaches to the rafter differently. It interacts with all the other parts differently. Imagine we replace one of the beams in the Hondo with a steel girder. Still the Hondo. But different. <laughs> but different. Definitely different. I hope it's not the beam of enlightenment. <laughs> That's right. Different. So these parts, these phenomena, thus function as a part of a total web of dependent causes and conditions each, in some sense, contained within everything else, even as it contains everything else. This is how the Tathagata perceives the world. And Hua Hian asserts that by learning to understand, through meditational practice, the nature of Buddhas and their powers, and the nature of the world as the Buddhas see it, we are able to cultivate a practice that leads to Buddhahood. It's from these insights that Hua Hian Buddhism offers descriptions like, inside everything is everything else, yet no things are confused. Each part in itself fully exemplifies the entirety of the whole. Nothing exists in and of itself, but requires everything to be what it is. All things are contained in each individual. Everything is identical because each phenomena relates to and defines every other phenomenon. And the whole universe is contained within a grain of sand. These provocative images contained continue to influence Chan, Pure Land, and Tiantai teachings. It's, it's a topic for another time, and for later in the series, but Kagon's influence on Japanese Buddhism goes on for centuries. Point being, as we hear teachings, uh, as we hear the teachings given here during these discussions, even through uh, uh, the weekly discussions or our, our ritual services and meditation, or through our Dharma talks in the Hondo, 
Huang Han philosophy can be heard permeating all of them, as does all the other Chinese schools of Buddhism we've already explored, Tiantai, Chan, Pure Land. I know these historical and doctrinal, uh, doctrinal discussions may not be seen as practical or useful, but I would disagree. So much of what we consider Tendai is, is related back to these four schools. They cannot be separated. As we practice and study Tendai, understanding a context for those teachings can provide a more robust perspective on what and how we practice and learn. Huayang Buddhism may be considered a doctrinal school, but what it offered to Buddhist practice was a new profound perspective of how to be in the cosmos. One in many, many in one. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's uh, go to the next slide. So any questions or comments? I love that just because. Ichishima said, say, do you have any yes, comments please. you would like to make? Ah, good morning. Uh, thank you for, uh, for your presentation about Huayen Kegon School. I think this is a very amazing sutra. And uh, in <clears throat> Indonesia, there is a huge uh, pagoda up tower, as Borobudur, so called. Uh, there are uh, inscribed uh, 53 Buddhas uh, from the bottom to the top of the, uh, uh, the stupa. And that means that the uh, Huayan school, or Huay, you know, Kegon, Kegon Nyo, Huayan Sutra contains such a uh, <clears throat> story like uh, uh, mentioned, uh, you mentioned, one in many, many in one. And according to Japanese uh, stories, that uh, there are uh, 53, or not, that there are 53 teachers in our lifetime to grow uh, as a humanities. So that was in the Edo period, uh, uh, so Tokaido Goju Sansi, 53 stations be, uh, between Edo and Kyoto, uh, 53 inns to stay. Uh, it takes uh, such a long time, uh, 53 days between uh, Edo, Edo, Tokyo to Kyoto. Uh, now Shinkansen, bread train, just uh, two two and a half hours from Tokyo to Kyoto. But uh, I, I think it is very interesting. Uh, during our lifetime, uh, everyone uh, <coughs> uh, to meet uh, with teachers, 53 teachers during a lifetime since childhood to adult. So this kind of teaching is very interesting. And Todaiji Temple, uh, that is a central temple at the Nara period, there is huge uh, Buddha, Daibutsu, uh, Mahavairochana, uh, uh, Birushana Butsu, uh, Vairochana Buddha. It's a very well-known, uh, huge, huge Buddhas. And at as, as that time, uh, they consider that is the center of Japan and uh, uh, 53 uh, provinces, there is a, each province has a Buddha or something, you, you know. This kind of ideas, it flows from the uh, Kengon, Kengon Sutra, Hawaiian Sutra, I think. And the, <clears throat> back to the origin of Buddha, uh, Buddha first awakened in such, you know, uh, cosmos. And uh, December the 8th, at the last uh, moment of meditation, <clears throat> uh, when the sun rises from the east, then the sun shines, um, brushed away all the darkness, and he suddenly awakened. Oh, this is a wonderful world. So this is, you know, the awakening one in many, many in one. So in one Buddhas, there are so many, uh, elements as uh, mentioned uh, so I think Kemon Sutra is very interesting sutra and the beginning of the uh, awakening of Buddhas but the disc is uh, so huge so when 
a Brahma uh, God cre uh, creator appeared uh, and whispered to Buddha Shakyamuni, oh, you got such an amazing enlightenment. Why not to spread such teachings to all people? So that is the beginning. And so he uh, left uh, the place of Buddha Gaya and to the uh, uh, place where five bhikshus there. And first uh, he taught such huge, uh, amazing uh, awakening. Nobody could understand. So he gradually teaches very uh, uh, basic uh, sutras around our lifetime. Uh, so, and gradually uh, the people's uh, students' uh, identity grows up. So this kind of uh, teaching is mentioned. Um, uh, uh, what should I say? This is uh, uh, Tendai, you know, Shikyogi, or for the teachings of Tendai. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, you notice uh, such Kengon Sutras. That is my comment now. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. I so, um, I'm going to turn the recording off. Oh, thank you so much.